Once again, I'm Andrew Dufresne. Thank you very much, like I said, for your patience. Uh, this is AP Biology Review on PMTV, the pandemic edition. Uh, so what does that mean? If you haven't been with us before, uh, we condense down the material just to review. I wanna hit the high notes to help you know what it is. As long as I understand this, I'm looking good for this year's very odd exam. Okay, so this week, the cell and energy. If you didn't catch our past classes, then uh, you can actually find those on YouTube, on our Prep Matters uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions, classes at prepmatters.com. Uh, you can find us on social media. Uh, Prep Matters is on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Mental Markets, hashtag PMTV, and that'll tag those comments and we'll see those. Uh, this week, the cell and energy. So we've been talking about this whole buildup process. And last week we ended with, okay, if all of this stuff is going on, how? Where's that energy coming from? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So we continue with the College Board AP Bio Big Ideas uh, and all the skills that we're expected to have, uh, thinking with a scientist mindset and approach. Uh, and I'm going to touch on each of these uh, with today's uh, topic of energy in the cell. Um, but really, uh, it, it's, I'm trying to come back to those same themes as well of my own kind of design and perspective after teaching this for years. And I think that it really resonates with students to basically say there are these commonalities that are happening through the every single unit. And it's not even so much as reworking these big ideas to fit those it's just seeing those big ideas for what they are and that it naturally follows that you would have one thing adapt and change and improve and what works sticks as an evolution. Or that, and we'll talk about this today, the universe tends towards stability, um, lower energy states, but more randomness uh, because that's actually easier to, to achieve as well. We're gonna talk about that. Um, or how, uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel with every generation. We want to keep around all the things that are working. And this means that we have to store that information, find a way to compartmentalize it, find a way to protect it, and then find a way to transmit that down each step. Not as relevant of a, you know, of a big idea for today's uh, topic of energy, but nonetheless, something I can, I can touch upon. Hugely today, systems interactions. Uh, it's, it's, common throughout all of the units, as I said, but the way I would view this is basically inputs and outputs, processes, one thing leading to another, uh, and then environmental exchange, environmental influence and impact. Um, and that is going to play a role in our uh, realm of energy as well. A reminder in the event you wanted to sum up the past uh, several hours of class over the past several weeks, uh, simpler things come together to make more complex things. Simple molecules to macromolecules, amino acids to polypeptides to giant uh, proteins, uh, giant in the sense of the cell and what they're doing and their roles. Uh, that structure and function uh, go hand in hand. The structure of something basically dictates its function. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, I've already discussed the role that uh, information storage and transmission can play. Um, dominant and recessive alleles determining gene expression. So this was just another bit that we had about genetics, inheritance, uh, heredity. Um, I don't think that also, considering it's so uh, tightly tied to info storage and transmission is as relevant in today's lesson, but I want you to aware uh, of those topics. Uh, the environment I've mentioned, so that is going to impact expression of things or simply uh, the occurrence of certain reactions. Um, and then today, uh, the things that we've talked about in the past that are going to take center stage are these reactions that occur over membranes and the extremely important role that proteins or molecular machines uh, are catalytic kingmakers, uh, what they do in order to allow anything to even happen. Okay. Let me remind you, if you have any questions during today's class, uh, just um, go ahead and use that raise your hand function, uh, type up your question in the Q&A, 
you, you raising your hand will tell me to uh, pop over and check that out. Uh, and I would love your questions because I think there's a lot of information here uh, and it helps us also make sure that we're addressing the topics that are stumping you in your review. Okay. So what are we going to talk about specifically today in terms of break, broken down chapters, so to speak? Uh, we're gonna talk about energy and how it flows from one location to another in biological systems. Uh, we're gonna talk about enzymes, special proteins that make this all happen. Uh, photosynthesis, it is that unit, folks. Uh, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Uh, these are gigantic topics that usually stump a lot of students because it seems so technical. I worked hard to find, not create, find some images. Uh, thank you to, once again to all my sources listed on the page. Uh, uh, boil down versions of what's really happening. You are going to come across really complex cycles and systems and chains. And some of that I kept in, in order to draw attention to the important bits, but otherwise I did not, because I want you to realize you do not need to know a lot of that material. Okay. Energy flow. Well, uh, we're doing AP Bio, but I've mentioned before, our biology is essentially applied chemistry. So, uh, <laughs> thank you for that, that question. I am going to get to that in one moment. Um, so, biology as applied chemistry means that we kind of have to fall back on these rules that chemistry has set for us. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. That means it is moving from one system or one place to another. And the second law tells us that entropy will never decrease. That's kind of weird. Entropy, randomness. So why would that never decrease? Creating order typically takes energy. It's so much easier to have a messy room or a messy desk or messy notes than to keep them organized because of that, all that effort and focus that it takes initially. It definitely pays off. I do not think that I am suggesting to keep things messy because it's easier. I'm just saying that I understand as it is the way of the universe. Uh, that randomness is not gonna play as much of a role uh, today I don't think I want to get into that super, um, uh, super deep uh, in the overview, but I want to mention this idea simply because uh, it plays uh, a role that I'm going to mention uh, when we talk about how do we consider this flow of energy? Well, it's also stored in chemical bonds. So our main focus is going to be chemical reactions. Very weird in AP biology, but really that's, that's what all of these proteins and enzymes are trying to achieve. That's what they're helping happen. Uh, and the energy itself, it can be stored in chemical bonds and that's, that's gonna play a very large role uh, in, in the main idea here, but it comes in many forms too. It can be stored in those chemical bonds, but we have potential energy that's just itching to actually turn into kinetic energy and happen. Uh, kinetic energy being that of motion, impossible without, uh, without, um, without motion for any of this to happen. And that also contributes to this concept of entropy. The more things move around, the more random that they are. So the more movement, the better that is. Remember all of these little topics as we come back to them uh, with some images to, to help you along. And then activation energy, that I think what I'm gonna end up having to do is draw for you guys uh, some of these reaction coordinates uh, myself. So uh, by all means, like I said, if you've got questions, raise your hand, let me know. But otherwise, we're going to change this up and we are going to go to here. Okay. In fact, let's go ahead and just make this the large screen entirely. Okay. So hopefully you can see that clearly. Do you recall seeing something, always oh, also have your Prep Matters pencil at the ready. Do you recall seeing these reaction coordinates where you would have energy on the y-axis, reaction progress down here on the x-axis, and you would have something like, say, a picture like this, 
This is, by the way, some of the best sort I think I could ever do. Reactants would be up here and products would be down here. Now, what the heck am I talking about? Well, today is all about cells and energy. Well, this is really the playing field for how that is all going about. We start with something. Here are our inputs to whatever our process is going to be. Here are our outputs or products. This, this exact situation here, you will see in a chemical formula system or a chemical reaction like that. Here are my reactants. Here are my products. This is the energy that those reactants happen to have. So uh, that could be stored up in their uh, chemical bonds. It could be a matter of um, you know, part of it being temperature that we actually have in the system. There's the role of the environment. And then here would be the energy of the products. Notice that it is lower. So the energy seems to be lost, but what inevitably what would end up happening here would be you'd be giving off some heat or you'd be significantly increasing in entropy or randomness, in which case uh, this would still abide by the laws of thermodynamics. So the other bit that I wanted to point out was this hump right here. You have to go up a little bit in order to have that downhill slide. We call this activation energy. Think of it like the push to any reaction. It needs a little nudge in order for it to happen. When we start off with a higher energy in reactants and we end with a lower energy in products, we call that an exergonic reaction. What that basically means is that energy is being given off. Remember before, like I said, a production of heat or something like that. So we don't have to get into something you may associate with all this Gibbs free energy. I'm not even gonna write it down. Uh, you don't need to know that equation. It would be mentioned in this unit in your class. Uh, but I simply wanted to point out this and then another way this could all happen is if you had the same axes, energy, progress. But in this case, we obviously have an increase. So energy was likely invested. Maybe we had to put in heat a significant amount that was then contributing to the potential energy here to make these products. We call this endergonic. Again, I simply want you to know what to, uh, to consider when you see these terms in your review. Okay, now, the big thing that we actually care about here is this guy, activation energy. Because when we're talking enzymes, we are talking about changing that investment. I'm gonna talk about this more in my next slide, but I wanna give you this visual now consider. So my reactants are here. Typically they need that much to get down to products. Okay. This is amazing by the way that I've actually managed to draw on these grid lines. I still manage to not do that most of the time. With an enzyme present, this reaction, this without an enzyme present, this reaction can happen. With an enzyme present, the major player in today, what we actually see is a decrease in that activation energy or energy of activation. So that is how they are helping things along. They're lowering the investment we have to put in in order to make the reaction happen. Keep that in mind. And I also would love to be able to have more time to appreciate the beauty of this and how this works. But uh, I'm going to stick to what you need to know for your questions and how you're going to be assessed. So that's one thing that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, let's go back uh, to this. Okay. So back to this. 
And here we go. Okay, so these, uh, these enzymes uh, are proteins that, like I said, structure gives function, right? So they have a structure that provides them the function to lower the activation energy like you saw and like you can see because I can't do both right here. So they're lowering this activation energy. The reason that that matters is because these reactions would happen on their own, but to be biologically relevant, to keep things in a timeline where we can actually see something happen, uh, we need it to happen faster and easier. We need some things to, to work almost on demand uh, in order to continually improve the way in which we respond to the environment. And so enzymes are this random collection of peptides that happen to get together and had a particular shape and that gave it a particular function to catalyze these reactions that we talk about generically from reactants to products. They catalyze because they're also not even used up. They're simply present and assist this process in happening. They are also entirely specific to the reactants or what we call substrates. Now, because the structure is providing the enzyme that function, the shape and charge of that substrate is some of the most important, are some of the most important components and uh, parameters um, in the interaction. They have to be tailored fit to what we call an active site. The component of an enzyme that bind substrate and convert it into products. Okay. So again, this reaction would happen, but now it's easier. It's allowing for us to respond quicker and get the products that we want from the reactants that we have and the specific enzyme uh, at work in order to happen. Any questions so far about that? What I want to get into now is a bit more about this idea of structure and function simply because you're going to be asked uh, or expected to know, uh, depending on which questions you're going to get, um, how exactly the structure and function um, interplay works. Um, what, what do we mean by this? This is what we call a space filling model of a protein. Uh, it doesn't get into necessarily the nitty gritty of the individual um, amino acids and polypeptides uh, in each region of the protein or what those molecular compounds are, the R groups and, and everything else. Uh, but what you can see is that it seems to have a, a, a particular cleft or um, site, this would be the active site, where something else could nestle. And that something else would be substrate. And what is going on here, the blue versus red, is actually indicating the general electropositivity in blue and negativity in red. And what do I mean by that? Well, if something is typically electropositive, then it's a little more positive. Uh, and uh, we can look at amino acids that have properties in R groups like that. And something that's a little more electronegative uh, is gonna be pulling on electrons closer um, and, uh, and being uh, essentially the, the amino acids with the more negative uh, side chains. So with that, those characteristics at play in the structure of the enzyme, they absolutely are in play in the shape and charge of substrate. Now, like I said before, this is beautiful how this all comes together, and I would really like to explore that, but I want you to at least consider, I can't, but I would like to at least consider the chemistry that had to have happened in order for this to happen and come about. And then we find, you know, there, there's a purpose to it, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a potential that it, it provides. And then we utilize that, and then that basically provides that greater ability um, and responsiveness in, in order to carry on and be, oh, let's keep that protein 
let's go ahead and, and make sure that we know how to make that uh, and pass that on to future generations. Apart from our energy uh, diagram that we were discussing earlier, uh, this is the general uh, reaction for the enzyme substrate interaction. And I show this because we're going to be talking about how this is regulated in a moment. But you have a particular um, shape and conformation in the active site fitting to a particular substrate, specificity. Also, if I mention something over and over again, clearly it's important. And that's the thing that they really want you to make sure that you know so that you can apply that knowledge on the free response questions in May. And that substrate binds the enzyme and forms an enzyme substrate complex. And then it doesn't really matter what those products in this case are or anything. Uh, this appears to have simply cleaved these two shapes, um, but uh, we would call that a protease. We're going to talk about that, what those names mean and everything a little bit so that when you see them, you're like, oh, okay, I can probably guess what that does, even if it's not something I specifically covered, because they do want you to make those kinds of extensions as well uh, when going through a problem. It won't be anything you can't handle, um, but uh, it can help you make sense of vocabulary that you see throughout the units. Um, so this enzyme then basically cleaves uh, this, this uh, connection here and creates products. And what's really important here is that this and this, the end of the enzyme, the beginning of the enzyme, they're identical, which means this guy can now circle back, take more substrate, create more products. And that's a huge idea to the idea, of, uh, to, uh, a huge component to the idea of increasing a reaction rate when we can reuse the parts like that. If we wanted to have this be even further refined, like say we have the protein, we have the enzyme, but we don't want to necessarily use it all the time, or under certain conditions, we need it to be even more active. That is where coenzymes and cofactors come in. Well, uh, cofactors can include things uh, other than coenzymes, uh, but they're typically ions and environmental Conditions. So what is it that, um, that we could think about and, and consider our coenzymes? Uh, you may actually have heard the more familiar term vitamins. Vitamins are actually coenzymes. They are not proteins. They're still just molecules. But what they do is they nestle into that active site in an enzyme and make it even better suited or suited in the first place to bind its substrate. This extra layer of regulation is that idea of smaller things coming together, bigger, more complex things. And it's also uh, that ability to uh, turn something on and off without uh, necessarily having to wait for it to be produced um, in order to use it exactly what we want. Uh, it's just another uh, really fascinating way that chemistry is at play here to even allow for biology to happen. But you have to be familiar with enzymes, coenzymes, and how they improve the ability or actually allow for the ability of the enzyme itself to catalyze a reaction, to bind a substrate uh, and have it uh, create the products. Other environmental controls you're going to want to, are going to want to be aware of are temperature and pH. So I mentioned in the beginning energy in all those different forms. Temperature is essentially giving kinetic energy to molecules. The higher temperature, you may remember this also from chemistry in terms of the ideal gas law, the increased temperature, the increased motion of the gas molecules, and they're going to end up having more collisions and reactions tend to happen uh, faster. And not, not to say that exothermic reactions, ones that produce heat, you increase the temperature, they can slow down. But what we want to talk about right now is how the energy, I wanted to address that in case there was a confusion there, but what really matters right now for our unit is that the temperature increase can lead to more collisions between substrate and enzyme. They can lead to more reactants uh, hitting each other and then making sure they hit each other in the right orientation in order to lead to a successful um, reaction and, and create products. Uh, that activation energy is the hump that we're trying to get over. Enzymes make that easier. Enzymes themselves still have an optimal temperature because they themselves are proteins and molecules in motion 
and uh, that conformation is going to change with that motion of those molecules. There is a downside. Too warm or too hot, and you can get protein denaturation or falling apart, taking away its nature, its structure. Enzymes as proteins are no different. So there's a point at which they can fall apart, and now that active site that may have been just right in that Goldilocks zone is now less specific, uh, softer, things are moving around, and then all of a sudden it falls apart. And now you definitely don't have an active site for substrate to bind. I mentioned this almost, or not almost, <laughs> entirely uh, uh, with uh, hesitation, but I wanted you to be aware that it was a, a possibility. Um, it's not a common thing that college board will throw out there, but it is something that they do cover. The Q10 factor is basically a factor that demonstrates the role temperature plays on enzymatic activity. So, because that this optimal range, if it's if it's super narrow, then temperature can play a higher role. But if you have a high activity at a lot of uh, at a broader curve, an optimal uh, rate that's over uh, a broader um, band of temperatures then it's not going to be as temperature dependent. Uh, R stands for the catalytic rate or, or reaction rate, uh, and T for temperature. So this T2 would be the higher temperature, and R2 would be the rate at that temperature. And if you, this is, it's on the equation sheet that College Board is going to remind you. So if you were to see it and be like, what the heck is that? We never talked about that. I at least wanted to cover my bases slash yours and mention it. It's about temperature dependency and enzymatic uh, activity and changes to the rates of reactions. Uh, but I really wouldn't worry about it too much beyond that definition. pH, we talked about this a little bit in the past as well, uh, and amino acids and acids and bases and stuff like that. Uh, there is an optimal pH for enzymatic activity as well. That idea of shape, we kind of talked a lot about with temperature effectively, but then also charge is gonna be impacted by another environmental component pH. So the more uh, protons there are in solution, the more acidic, and that would be lower on the pH scale. There are enzymes that prefer that range. Enzymes in our uh, gastric system, in our stomach, those actually turn on with a lower pH because then what we know is, oh, we're producing stomach acid. So let me turn this enzyme on and digest this uh, substrate, turning into products, and then carry on. Uh, and then there are others that prefer more basic uh, conditions. So the role of the environment is not just at that cellular level uh, or at that uh, phenotypic level. Uh, it really is playing um, a significant role even at the molecular level here with enzymes. One other equation that you're going to have to know as well, again, you probably have seen this one uh, in chemistry, but uh, you just want to be aware that you won't be having to do any calculations, but pH equals the minus the log of proton concentration. That's what that bracket around H plus means. So the higher that proton concentration, the lower, because of the negative, the lower the pH. And the lower the proton concentration, the higher the pH on a scale of um, 1 to 14. Another way that we can regulate enzymatic activity is through interaction with other proteins. So uh, competitive and non-competitive are the only forms of inhibition that you're going to need to know. Uh, there is another called uncompetitive because why not? Uh, but we're going to focus on competitive versus non-competitive. They are kind of what you'd expect. Competitive inhibition is when the inhibitor basically binds to the active site, prevents and competes with the substrate so that it cannot bind, and then you do not get the reaction. This means that the inhibitor is going to resemble the substrate in terms of its area that uh, binds that active site. But it also means that it's not actually doing anything to the enzyme or to the substrate, which means if we flood a competitive inhibitor like this with just way more substrate, if we put in way higher substrate concentration, then it can outcompete the competitive inhibitor. So 
it's it, this, this, the competitive inhibitor as well can also be reversible or irreversibly binding to that active site, which means it could go in, it could come out, or it could go in and just stay, but it can't possibly get to every bit of the enzyme that's available unless the concentration was super high. And if it doesn't, then what we can do is put in even more substrate and increase our chances of substrate getting to the enzyme active site. Non-competitive inhibition is also what you'd expect. Uh, it's not competing with the substrate in the active site. It's saying, go ahead, you know, you want that active site, that's yours, but I am going to change the shape so that it doesn't even matter that you have access to it. The inhibitor binds to another spot on the enzyme called an allosteric site. And just as we have before with knowing the language of these topics, we can break down that word. We're going to do that with some of the energy processes we're about to talk about too. But allo, other, steric, the, the shape or conformation, the ability to access. So it's changing that conformation in the enzyme and then the substrate, it's, it's sterically hindered. It can't actually bind because now the active site is not the thing that it is catered, that caters to it. So in, uh, a, a non-competitive inhibitor, it does not matter how much substrate you put in, unless you're of course targeting the bit of enzyme that you don't think um, uh, is being, uh, binded by uh, the non-competitive inhibitor. But otherwise, the, the idea here is that you can't outflood a non-competitive inhibitor. Just be aware of these two kinds of inhibition because they're fodder for those questions, but also be aware of the strong role that structure and function play here. Just as structure and function uh, are behind thermal and pH dependent optimal ranges, temperature and pH dependent optimal ranges for enzyme function, um, and how shape and charge with the substrate and the enzyme there are having to be exact in particular. The same thing here, uh, but now with proteins as the culprit instead of you know, something else in the environment. Obviously, this is also very different than what a coenzyme is doing in terms of improving its ability um, to catalyze the reactions that it catalyzes. So we've talked about these machines that we happen to have that lower activation energy in order to make something easier to come about. That energy itself is stored a lot of times in chemical bonds. And sometimes, if you recall, we have uh, reactions that may require an increase in energy. The endergonic reactions. So let me show you this here. So in these endergonic reactions, we had to actually invest energy and put in more than what we may be getting out from an extragonic reaction. Okay. Well, what if we were to find a way to take some of these reactions here where you end up netting, some, seemingly netting some energy. It's obviously still stored in whatever else um, uh, is either coming off in products or changes to the uh, surroundings of the system. But the energy that seems to be gained here, what if we were to find a way to use that here and again make this easier? Not only will enzymes lower my activation energy, but uh, I can actually um, couple or link a reaction like this to a reaction like this. Well, that's really what this idea of um, bioenergetics and the flow of energy in biological systems is about. And you a lot of times are uh, going to have to spend some energy to net more energy. And it's, again, it's that inputs and outputs. The main molecule that you're going to be seeing again and again in this unit is adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, this beautiful molecule on the screen. And in fact, the most important component of this entire thing is that bond right there. That bond right there is one of the phosphodiester bonds. And were we to cleave right here, we would remove one phosphate. You would end up having the water come in because of the hydrolysis, uh, which we talked about in the very beginning. 
and it would end up having an OH uh, here, just as this one does, but it would be in this spot. And this conversion from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate, that, that is literally how everything happens. There is so much energy stored in that bond, life is settled on that as the thing that we both want to store and that we want to release and use. And the fact that it all comes down to something like that and that it happens to be one of the uh, molecules that is in our base because this is the same A in adenosine in our DNA uh, and in our RNA. Uh, I, I, I think that that uh, really needs to stick. You've got to take that away for an idea here. So if that's the whole name of the game, where do we get it? Uh, how do we make it? How do we store it? If it's the basis of everything for the energy of life itself, then it clearly is uh, the name of the game. So what happened first were some prokaryotes, uh, not eukaryotes. They, if you recall, were in um, an oxygen poor environment. There was plenty of light, there was sun. This is how we even have life on this planet. And there were a lot of those uh, noxious gases initially. Uh, we talked about how uh, organic molecules formed, with proteins and macromolecules. One of those gases that was available was CO2. One of those molecules that was available, as we know, was H2O. One of the molecules that was not available was oxygen. And uh, one of the energy sources that was available was light, was the sunlight. So these prokaryotes were photosynthetic. They, they basically figured out a way to stick up, to, to, to hold on to a protein that was capable of taking the energy from sunlight with the other components that it had available of CO2 and H2O and creating something as simple as glucose, sugars, that six carbon sugar. Now I've been just talking about ATP and now I'm talking about glucose, but this is the storage. ATP still plays a role in peers in this process, but it's all about that storage at the end of glucose. I am trying to get you to focus on uh, the highlights of these things and really make sure that you are um, uh, paying special attention to these reactions and the commonality between all of them. So when we make them simpler and simpler and simpler like this, we can start to see those connections a little bit easier than those giant charts. And those images are still coming. But whether you go by the chemical reaction on the top or uh, their actual identity uh, in words in the bottom, it's still carbon dioxide and water leading to glucose and oxygen. How does it do that? That protein that I said it managed to, to har uh, harness um, are, uh, it, well, it's basically uh, these uh, chloroplast organelles uh, that have additional substructures in them. We talked about the chloroplast a little bit last week. Um, something in plants, not something in animals. Uh, they were photosynthetic. Um, and the outer membrane and inner membrane, that kind of resembles mitochondria. It doesn't replace them. Plants still have mitochondria. We're going to get to that. But they also have these other structures inside thylakoids. So there's the outer membrane, the inner membrane, the stroma, which is the fluid that would be inside that inner membrane. And then in that stroma are these grana stacks. Uh, one stack would be uh, a granum, but these grana that each are also made up of thylakoids. And those thylakoids have something called photosystem one and photosystem two. This you have probably seen before. It looks very complicated, and I want to highlight just the bits that matter. And it's not going to be uh, that much of it. Uh, you want to be aware that light is coming in, going through an enzyme called, or, or a, yeah, an, an enzyme, uh, photosystem 2. Water is being split. Electrons are moving, none of this matters, none of this matters, to photosystem 1 and then being dumped onto a final acceptor of NADPH. 
Now I want you to follow that path again. Light comes down both here and actually here, photosystem one. Why is two first? Well, because we discovered photosystem one first. So they're named by their discovery, not by their order of operation. This P680 refers to the wavelength of light. And so by having two different wavelengths here, you can also see, okay, broader light, that would be actually be accessible. Uh, um, some systems may be more favored um, in uh, one environment or by one organism by another. Um, so light comes into each of these photosystems. Water is split to basically make oxygen and then uh, protons. When that electron is actually transported from photosystem one over to photosystem two, that transfer in a very coupled way, that is a natural energy going downhill um, process that gets coupled with this idea of pumping these protons over this inner membrane here. Uh, to remind you where we are in the event, uh, I didn't mention that enough, this is the thylakoid membrane. So this here is the stroma, the gooey center of the chloroplast, and this here is the, uh, the thylakoid lumen, the gooey inside of the thylakoid. But the thylakoid itself uh, has this membrane, and as one does, as we've covered from the mesosome and bacteria all the way to the mitochondria and uh, animal cells and chloroplasts here in plant cells for photosynthetic organisms, uh, they are key to inputs and outputs of processes and interaction with the environment. So protons come through uh, thanks to the energy of this downhill process. And then when that electron is dumped here, you've essentially increased the energy of what was an NADP molecule. You do not know, need to know what it is, just that it's NADP, and that it is uh, then becoming NADPH from uh, an electron and a proton coming together to basically provide a whole other atom of hydrogen. Protons being pumped across and being produced by the splitting of water leads to a proton gradient which means a buildup of protons on one side and less on the other. Notice that we've used them up here and we've been pumping them. We've been generating them here and we've been pumping them to this side. Another couple of reaction. See, it's all about enzymes. It's all about energy cost and energy payoff. It's all about uh, linking things together so that smaller, simpler processes, even when they're individually complex, can end up generating an even more um, complex or higher order uh, function. And in this case, we have the only enzyme that you need to know in this unit, ATP synthase. So what happens here is the protons happen to fit in the uh, conformation of the ATP synthase just right, so that upon lining into them, it each time changes the conformation of the ATP synthase and then when enough protons are lined up in it and flow through it, it's allowing uh, as perhaps a, um, a cofactor, uh, as it is an ion, uh, it allows this enzyme to better bond, uh, uh, bind its substrate of ADP and phosphate. And then it puts those together and makes ATP. Now remember the naming that I talked about? ATP synthase. Synthesis, creation, A's, it's an enzyme that ends in A's. We've seen this with lactase from the lac operon that we talked about for the original genetic uh, gene regulation uh, unit uh, several weeks ago. But this production of ATP right here, um, this is photophosphorylation. So photophosphorylation is uh, when you have basically light leading to um, this ability to uh, phosphorylate uh, ADP into um, ATP. Okay. Uh, other things that you may, so the wavelengths, what I wanted to get at for a little bit, but I didn't want to bring them in into to images and everything, um, were chlorophyll A and B and carotenoids, because you may come across these as well. They're essentially um, the uh, molecules that are capable of taking in that light and um, absorbing that 
in order for it to be used. Um, so the other thing about that is the wavelengths, just as there's an ideal temperature pH to enzyme function, there are ideal uh, um, absorption and emission spectra. Uh, this idea of, of uh, a molecule uh, absorbing particular wavelengths of light and reflecting others. Color comes from this idea of reflection. So things that are green are reflecting green light and absorbing the other ones. And that's what chlorophyll A and B do. Carotenoids tend to be orange, yellow, and red in color. And that's because they're reflecting those colors and absorbing more of the green light. So you can then also see how plants themselves adapt to available wavelengths and change up what the actual color of their cells uh, in core mass and everything are. Um, so yeah, something like you know carotenoids and carrots, um, and uh, well, chlorophyll obviously being ubiquitous amongst green plants. Any questions so far about the role of enzymes? Got photosystems two, one, and ATP synthase. Again, really, this is the only name that you're really going to need to know. Uh, chemiosmosis, that process of uh, a chemical uh, going um, downstream because it's osmosis. So it goes with the gradient from a high gradient to a low gradient, this chemiosmosis through the ATP synthase and the production of energy by the production of ATP. This we can now use as a, like a coin as currency in our reactions because of that bond right here that we re recreated uh, thanks to this enzyme. Okay, then moving on. Uh, those, as you saw, were light dependent reactions. The light comes in, interacts with photosystems one and two, excites electrons and passes them down the chain. These used to be called the Kalpin cycle uh, this portion used to be called dark reactions. They may still be called that at times. That's a misnomer because they actually happen in the light. So uh, they're light independent in that it is not coming into these particular reactions or this cycle, but um, they are actually occurring uh, during the daytime, in the event you have that flipped in your head. Um, the Calvin cycle has an... It's, you're going to see the Krebs cycle a little bit later on. Uh, the Calvin cycle, uh, I know we're, we're coming up on time. I started uh, a little bit later, and so I want, to, I want to get through everything and give you guys full time here. Uh, the Calvin cycle has a lot of different organic molecules and a lot of different um, uh, orientations of, of carbon in, in increasing numbers and then how it's split up and, and broken down or built up. I didn't want you to focus on any of that because you don't need to know any of that. What you need to know are your inputs and outputs. CO2 in, there is actually some ATP in, if you notice here. So we have to use some energy in order to generate what we want here, so the output. So we're using some energy here. We're using what, one of those electron carriers that we talked about, where you had electrons end up on this terminal acceptor, the NADPH. Those are used in the cycle. And then more ATP over here as well. Why would we do all this and, and what are we creating? Well, three molecules of CO2 can create a three carbon sugar because of those three carbons. But if we were to do this twice, we could make those three carbon sugars turn into a six carbon sugar, glucose. The very beginning I talked about how that's what we're making in the end, and here it is. We're making glucose in the end to store our energy. So it's not even that we're actually, yeah, sure, we're putting this energy in here uh, in order to make it, but now we can actually keep it. So we get the light, and then we can store that energy. This is the brilliance of sustainable energy. Uh, you can continually take it in, and then if you have a good uh, way to store it, you can use it at will. Once we have that glucose, now we're going into a process that every part of life does, animals and plants. Cellular respiration. It's the breakdown of glucose into the energy that we need. There are multiple different processes uh, that make up cellular respiration, but I want you to focus on glucose and oxygen coming together to make carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. That means that if we don't have the glucose, we obviously 
we can't go through this and make the ATP. But if we don't have the oxygen, we can't either. So the, the, the need, like the taking in of plants of CO2 is order to make their glucose, but they still need oxygen to go through cellular respiration as well, because they also have mitochondria. And we're going to talk about what happens when you don't have oxygen. Glycolysis, the first process I'm sure that you've also seen. Another one that's probably got a bunch of different organic molecules, different orientations of carbon. And I don't want you to worry about that. It's a six carbon sugar that takes two ATP to convert uh, in to the end two three carbon molecules. Each three carbon molecule is a pyruvate. So from one glucose, uh, we get two pyruvates or pyruvic acid. Uh, it's just whether or not the proton is still on because it hasn't donated it or like acetic acid and acetate, pyruvic acid uh, and pyruvate. Uh, but either way, one glucose, two pyruvate. There is an input of two ATP, but you net two ATP by making four. So already just in this process, or two ATP up. Plants have, yes, put in energy in order to make their glucose. How are animals getting it? Food. They're ingesting it. We're heterotrophs. We get food and energy from others. We're not autotrophs. We don't make it ourselves or, or, or make that energy source ourselves through the use of light. You can't make energy out of nothing, so it's a conversion from light to glucose. And then it's going to be from glucose to ATP. And then from ATP into whatever else it is that we can fuel as we make that ATP, which then becomes it, the input to the ATP synthesis again so that the enzyme can repeat. Again, I know I'm repeating all these things, but it's all of that uh, aspect of connection. Uh, the other thing here is that we don't have NADPH, we have NADH. That is our electron carrier. It starts off as NAD plus, and then we, uh, we start off with two of those, and then we end up with two NADH, and those are going to bring their electrons to the electron transport chain, which is still not the same one as what we saw before. That was photosystem one and two. Once we have that pyruvate, step to my own line here. Where does glycolysis happen? And then on this slide, we see that, oh, pyruvate's in the cytosol. Uh, so glycolysis is happening in the cell. It's a generic process that's happening uh, in, in every walk of life. And so that breakdown is happening in just the main cell uh, compartment, the cytosol. And then the presence of oxygen allows us to oxidize pyruvate. You can see here it's pyruvate because it's missing that H if it had uh, an H in the spot of the pyruvic acid. Uh, we oxidize this, generate CO2, another NADH, and we bring in this thing called coenzyme A, coenzyme, uh, that binds to uh, what's left behind here, which is an acetyl group, and then we have acetyl-CoA. What do you need to know? Pyruvate in, acetyl-CoA out. Pyruvate in the cytosol needs oxygen to get oxidized to uh, do this process over the outer membrane into the mitochondria. It's actually going to be uh, uh, then moving on over the inner membrane into the uh, matrix of the mitochondria. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, and then the production of uh, NADH uh, for a electron carrier as well. That's, that's all you need to know here. Although this topic of pyruvate oxidation is not often uh, uh, not covered as often, and I wanted to make sure that we discussed it because uh, it's the big component to aerobic versus anaerobic respiration. Okay, Krebs cycle. This is where that acetyl-CoA goes. So it's the input. And again, another cycle where like the Calvin one and glycolysis, you probably have a bunch of images with a ton of complex um, organic molecules. Don't need to know any of them. What you need to know is that acetyl-CoA goes in, and NADH, and uh, there's another one, and I forgot to add it here, apologies, FADH2, uh, but those are our electron carriers. And then also, uh, we do make a little ATP here as well. CO2 
was uh, being produced by the oxidation, and then it's coming out here uh, and coming out here. So you can see the production of carbon dioxide overall as well, but acetyl-CoA in little ATP out, NADH and FADH2 out. This is in the matrix of the mitochondria. Cytosol with glycolysis, hydrogate oxidation over the membrane of the mitochondria, Krebs cycle in the very gooey center, the matrix, like the stroma of the uh, chloroplast, which is when the cycle happens. See all the similarities between each system and how they go about solving similar yet specific problems. And then those electron carriers go on to the electron transport chain. See how the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, another name for it, the citric acid cycle, because you start with citrate um, as one of those um, carbon uh, molecules that I mentioned you don't need to know. Uh, but another name for the Krebs cycle is the citric acid cycle or TCA cycle. Uh, that uh, is in the matrix of the mitochondria. And then those electron carriers only have to go so far as the inner membrane, kind of like the thylakoid membrane uh, for photophosphorylation uh, that we mentioned before. But in this case, we have these um, electron carriers uh, drop off their electrons in a series of, of um, enzymes at a chain. And upon having that electron passed down in an energy favorable, favorable manner, we can pump protons across against the gradient, again, putting them here in that um, uh, intermembrane space. And then uh, those electrons continue on through their path. You do not need to know these enzymes, just that they are enzymes and how those operate, which we discussed earlier. And then oxygen is not our final, well, our oxygen is our final acceptor of electrons, but that basically, uh, with available protons here as well, creates water. And uh, that happens uh, in a number of places around the membrane. Uh, they're trying to draw attention to other components that are coming off the cycle. I think that that's important to address in terms of inputs and outputs how the outputs of one cycle can become the input of another. Uh, that's the interconnectedness between all these um, systems as well, the systems interactions that College Board likes to address. Um, and we've seen this process, as I mentioned before, about the membranes, the mesosome of bacteria, which we then co-opted to make mitochondria, uh, photosynthetic prokaryotes may have been co-opted to create the chloroplasts, um, and those same photosynthetic prokaryotes oxygenated the atmosphere, thank you very much, and allowed for so much other chemistry in life to happen. And then that protein, proton gradient that we created here flows through chemiosmosis, through the ATP synthase, allowing for us to make more ATP. So we've gone from glucose to ATP now, and this is cellular respiration. This process right here is called oxidative phosphorylation, not photophosphorylation because we need an oxygen in order to get to this spot. What happens if we don't have oxygen? Two different possibilities. Fermentation, uh, sorry, conscious, two different possible products. Fermentation can produce either alcohol or lactate or lactic acid, which you may recall from lactic acid buildup or something like that. Uh, when you are uh, you know, uh, starving for oxygen, uh, you are still going to break down sugars in order to get that energy that you can. We're only getting two ATP. Uh, I'm sure you'll have come across in your notes the tables about um, all of the numbers. Uh, it's always impressed upon as an important thing in class, but I never often, I don't see it in the response questions. But nonetheless, um, that would be uh, the, the oxidative phosphorylation produces uh, tens of ATP, over 30 ATP. Uh, and so now without the oxygen, all we can do is glycolysis. Um, and uh, uh, that's only producing two ATP. So we still do that, but then how do we use the pyruvate? It can't get oxidized and enter into the, uh, to create acetyl-CoA and go into the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. So what happens? Well, um, in uh, bacteria and fungi, something like yeast, uh, you can have something like this happen where either the pyruvate uses some of this energy going back, NADH to NAD, and then produces either lactate or ethanol, 
Uh, in the case of ethanol, it releases CO2 as well. Again, I'm focused on the inputs and outputs here. I don't want you worrying about a lot of the other, <coughs> excuse me, um, use your arm, not your hands. Uh, some of the other um, um, chemical components, it's just inputs and outputs uh, for these processes. If you can know that anaerobic respiration, no oxygen present, anaerobic versus aerobic, where oxygen is, cellular respiration respiration is aerobic, and this is anaerobic respiration. Uh, as long as you know that as fermentation increases ethanol and lactate, you're going to be fine with that. Thank you for sticking with us uh, at this time. And what I want to do uh, for just a couple more minutes is go over a free response question. Um, I hope that this kind of uh, did a big job of reducing the complexity of a lot of these systems that you talked about with energy, uh, that it focused on just the protein names that you need, just the environmental conditions that you need to consider, uh, where things are happening, similarities that exist between animals and plants. Um, but if you do have any questions, please reach out, classes at petmatters.com, hashtag PMTV. You can reach me on Twitter at, uh, at Mental Markets. Uh, let's go over a free response question uh, using this information. Okay. So, this could be something that you see. You clearly see glycolysis happening here, but that is just this portion. And then pyruvate oxidation happening here to produce acetyl-CoA. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Krebs cycle, acetyl-CoA coming in. Uh, see that FADH2? I mentioned it. I just didn't have it in my drawing. Uh, and this GTP here uh, is actually going to end up being coupled to the production of the ATP that I mentioned. I just thought this detail wasn't entirely necessary. And then the electron transport chain. And again, they're going to provide some of this extra detail that you don't really need to know, but you don't need to know it because they're providing it, and also because it's not what they're going to be looking for in their answers. What's the question? The question is, cellular respiration includes, pardon me, the metabolic pathways of glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, as represented in the figures. In cellular respiration, carbohydrates and other metabolites are oxidized and the resulting energy transfer reactions support the synthesis of ATP. Using the information above, describe one con contribution of each of the following in ATP synthesis. Catabolism, more vocabulary, I'll mention that in, in a moment. Catabolism of glucose in glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation. Catabolism is the breaking down. Remember how I said uh, uh, hydrolysis, water, breaking bond, uh, from ATP to ADP, glycolysis, lysis there again, what's going on there, the breaking down of glyco sugar, glyco is sugar. So the breakdown of glucose is glycolysis, that's a catabolism because it's uh, catalysis, the breaking down of things, breaking apart, and then pyruvate oxidation. Pyruvate is being oxidized by having uh, electrons removed, uh, that is oxidation in the chemical sense, and so that's breaking that down as well. Oxidation of intermediates in the Krebs cycle, don't need to know them, but you could point them out uh, in terms of very generic terms, or formation of a proton gradient by the electron transport chain. And then after having described one contribution of each of those, use each of the following observations to justify the claim that glycolysis first occurred in a common ancestor of all living organisms. Uh, nearly all existing organisms perform glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs under anaerobic conditions, and glycolysis occurs only in the cytosol. Remember how I talked about things uh, being shared amongst different walks of life? And I mentioned the chronology of how prokaryotes uh, were the first uh, uh, to oxygenate the atmosphere for us uh, with their photosynthesis first, uh, but then also doing their own uh, cellular respiration once there was oxygen, and that glycolysis can happen in bacteria uh, and fungi uh, like yeast. Uh, even without it. Uh, that's because the questions are always going to marry a number of different topics and connect them. Making those connections is thinking like a scientist and drawing on those skills. And that's why I do it in my review with you guys, and that's why uh, it's on here for questions in terms of to assess that skill. Okay, so hopefully even during my blabbing you've had a chance to think about this. I would suggest uh, pausing if you wanted to use this in order to then uh, dive into the question. Um, for the moment, uh, I just want to jump into the question and answers. 
Uh, so, using information above, describe one contribution of each of the following ATC, ATP synthesis. They even gave you the three different reactions, so you didn't even have to remember all of those. But you can spend less time trying to understand them because you studied them beforehand. All they are looking for, for that first part, is the catabolism of glucose and glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation produces NADH as an electron transporter. Uh, for the electron transport chain. We mentioned that in our analysis. Produces acetyl-CoA for entry into the Krebs cycle because we're combining glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation here. So te technically your output at the very end of that would be acetyl-CoA. Uh, and it provides energy um, for phosphorylation of ADP. That's a fun way of saying it also produces its own ATP. That's not oxidative phosphorylation. That's called substrate level phosphorylation because it is simply, uh, this, is, this is actually going to be using um, a, uh, well, an ATP synthase, but uh, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate, no carbons on it, so it's inorganic, being available uh, can go to ATP, and that happens even from uh, just the transfer of energy of uh, in glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation. Uh, then for the oxidation of intermediates in the Krebs cycle. Okay, so let's truly see what we could have gotten here uh, just for one of these that we covered. Produces NADH or FADH2 for the use in the electron transport chain. We covered that. Those are electron transport carriers. Uh, those are, our, yeah, our, our electron carriers. We uh, know that we need to follow those, and we know we need to acknowledge them as either inputs or outputs. With these high-energy electrons for use, we talked about how the electrons going through the chain um, are a downstream process allowing for something else to happen. The conformational changes that are happening in the Krebs cycle are the easier sub-steps that can happen. We have enzymes catering to each of those as well to make that even easier in order for uh, one output to become the next input and get around to regenerating our starting material, something like acetyl-CoA, and then also um, along the way, taking things that we want, like NADH and FADH2. Um, provides energy to pump protons against their concentration gradient, that I definitely mentioned in the intermembrane um, uh, in the mitochondria, and then produces GTP for substrate level phosphorylation of ADP. Remember how I mentioned up here this GTP? I didn't really mention that because I think what you could have said here, if you saw this, you connected it to ATP, great. But otherwise, this here is really just going to be another coupled reaction to ATP synthesis uh, at the substrate level. Lastly, formation of a proton gradient by the electron transport chain. How is that contributing to the synthesis of ATP? It is the biggest contributor. The flow of protons through the membrane-bound ATP synthase and the inner membrane of the mitochondria produces ATP uh, and a very large amount. Uh, and then this is um, the uh, energy use for oxidative phosphorylation of ADP. So there's sometimes different ways to also kind of mention a very similar process, but I want you to focus here on how we mentioned the main point for each of these uh, you may hear my younger daughter in the background there. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, but we covered each of the main points that you need to know here, and you could be fine on a question like this. You don't have to get crazy detailed with all the structures and everything. A lot of students worry about that. Part B, do I have this? Uh, yes. Um, here would be, um, and did we, one second. Talked about B and then there's C and D here as well. Um, part B, use each of the following observations to justify the claim that glycolysis first occurred in the common ancestor of all living organisms. Uh, every organism performs glycolysis. It happens in the cell, uh, inside the uh, cytosol of the cell. No special component other than its cell itself. Um, and the justification would be uh, uh, the claim that um, it does occur in every single uh, one, or, or why, how we would justify that it does occur in every single one, um, is that that ability was passed down, which is something we've been talking about with storage information and transmission. Um, but that also, it allowed for the storage of energy as sugar, uh, 
and then the breakdown of that sugar into energy to help make reactions that otherwise would have taken too much investment or taken too long to happen. And that is inherently an advantage. It brings it back to that idea of responsiveness to the environment. And the cells that are better at doing that are going to be the ones that end up dividing and moving. Uh, glycolysis occurs under anaerobic conditions. So we didn't need an oxygenated atmosphere for this to happen. Um, so that means that this predates uh, the specialization that came with eukaryotes. And then glycolysis occurs only in the cytosol. Um, we kind of mentioned that earlier as part of our observation about them occurring in every single organism. So keep it simple and tight in your uh, answers. But the origin of glycolysis um, is uh, prior to the specialization um, of organelles inside those cells. Uh, in part C, C and D, uh, I chose this question because it was longer, but I know I'm running quite late, so thank you for sticking around. Um, a researcher estimates that in certain organisms, the complete metabolism of glucose produces 30 molecules of ATP for each molecule of glucose. The energy released from the total oxidation of glucose under standard conditions is 686 kcal per mole. There's a reason we didn't cover these details, because they're providing them in the question. The energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP, so I want you to know what that means. And inorganic phosphate, again, under standard conditions is 7.3 kilocals per mole. Calculate the amount of energy available from the hydrolysis of 30 moles of ATP. Calculate the efficiency of total ATP production from one mole of glucose. Describe what happens to the excess energy that is released from the metabolism of glucose. That can seem like a lot, but if you recognize units, then you can say, oh, well, if I, uh, if the energy released from the oxidation of glucose is 686 kcal per mole, and the energy released from ATP to ADP is 7.3, uh, then the amount available from the hydrolysis of 30 moles of ATP is just literally going to be uh, multiplying that. And that 30 is because of the oxidative phosphorylation that I mentioned. So you multiply those, and you get 219 kcal. But that efficiency um, from the glycolysis to what you get out of it uh, is quite low. And they did the math here. I don't think I need to walk you through that. Um, and then one other thing that I did want to bring up, uh, this idea of that excess energy, is if we decouple oxidative phosphorylation. So if we decouple oxidative phosphorylation, that last step of ATP synthase with uh, let me go ahead and make sure that this is going to be shared here. Um, if we decouple that ATP synthase from uh, glycolysis and everything else from the electron transport chain, if we uh, determine how much energy we should be making and how much we actually are and that efficiency and everything, uh, then what we come to is this this is this uh, this excess energy. Like what is going on with that? And endotherms warm-blooded animals like us, anything that's not dependent upon the environment for heat and kind of creates our own, own, that decoupled reaction, we've been talking a lot about coupling things together, that decoupled reaction uh, is released as, uh, allows for the release of heat. This is actually a brown fat in newborns. Uh, it's a certain kind of adipose tissue and it's insulated. Um, and it's a decoupling of that uh, energy production from glycolysis uh, in order to produce uh, heat. That temperature and kinetic energy they reference here in, in the scoring guidelines and increase in entropy, which is why I mentioned the very beginning, but that increase in temperature, that increase in kinetic energy of everything moving around, that's more randomness. We've increased the randomness of the surrounding uh, by releasing that heat. Um, so the, uh, the fate of that excess energy is the release of heat or increase of entropy slash and increase of entropy. Okay, one last part, and then we're going to go back. Um, again, thanks so much for sticking around. I know this has uh, uh, been a slightly rougher patch, but we're hanging in there. We've learned a lot. I'm still available for questions. Please let me know. Uh, the last part of this question, the enzymes of the Krebs cycle function in the cytosol of bacteria, but among eukaryotes, the enzymes function mostly in mitochondria. Pose a scientific question that connects the subcellular location of the enzymes in the Krebs cycle to the evolution of eukaryotes. 
I do promise that my fun little stories aren't just there to be fun little stories. Uh, I want them to be, but I also want them to be informative and to help you make connections and be prepared for a question like this. We've been talking about compartmentalization. We've been talking about localization of these reactions and keeping that in mind as an, as an important component along with inputs and outputs. Where are they happening? And why are they happening there? And how does that connect in, in the chronology of the evolution of life? Well, now's your time to shine for one whopping point. Uh, but as they point out in uh, their uh, answer here, they're basically describing endosymbiotic theory. So if bacteria were uh, co-opted by eukaryotes or absorbed by another cell uh, that was advanced with, with organelles or becoming advanced with organelles, if we co-opted that bacteria and kind of turned it into the mitochondria, uh, then, or the bacteria into mitochondria, plural and plural, make sure we get these uh, words right, um, then what's happening in the inside and they're in the cytosol of the bacteria is actually the matrix of um, the... Uh, mitochondria. So the Krebs cycle happening in the cytosol of bacteria, it hasn't actually moved. It's still in the matrix of the mitochondria. Glycolysis is in the cytosol of us, as it is in bacteria, in eukaryotes in general. But the Krebs cycle happening in the cytosol of bacteria and not our cytosol is because, well, that component of their cytosol uh, would be the cytosol of the mitochondria uh, or the matrix. So um, a valid scientific question related evolution of eukaryotes, since the Krebs cycle occurs in the cytoplasm of the mitochondria matrix, does it suggest that mitochondria were once prokaryotes? So posing a question instead of a statement is a really fun way of saying something interesting without having it to be answered. <laughs> so uh, reframe the lessons that we've had in an engaging way uh, and make your question. And, uh, and anything that, that has all that content that we just discussed, you'd be on your way, you'd be fine. Okay, well that is that question. And if you wanted uh, more practice, go over here. Uh, so that was this number, uh, number two from test 2015, if I hadn't mentioned that before. If you want more practice, there's another question uh, that involves some of these topics um, and talks a little bit more about environmental niche, which is another larger topic you didn't actually get to or, or won't be a unit that's gonna be on the uh, free response questions in general uh, or expected knowledge, but it's, 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 you've got enough already in these units to make this extrapolation, to make this jump. Uh, but it's about bacteria in our mouth, uh, in our teeth specifically, and the different pH levels of different environments and how different ones prefer that and why that may be. And it relates back to this idea of anaerobic and aerobic uh, respiration. So I think it'd be another good way to assess your knowledge and familiarity with these concepts. But I will also say that remember, focusing questions one and four from past exams for the style and expectations. It's gonna be a longer one, or sorry, a shorter one and a longer four on the real thing given the time uh, constraints that College Board has told us. Uh, but all of the few response questions are great ways to make sure that were that topic the heart of the nature of the question you were to be asked to answer, uh, you'd be prepared and then you'd know you would be. Um, once again, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's been a lot, it's been a pleasure despite everything else. I so enjoy our time together and talking about this stuff. I want to do it more. So reach out, classes at prepmatters.com, hashtag PMTV. I'm Andrew Dufresne and I'm at Mental Markets. Uh, enjoy the rest of your studying. Uh, we will be back one more time next week at least uh, for the cell and communication because we've got all this energy now. We've got all the specialization. We've got our cell as our main uh, player and main actor on the stage, but there's a lot of other cells. And how do they communicate? And how do they inter uh, interact with the environment in ways uh, that we haven't even discussed yet? Or how have the ways that we have discussed have a larger impact and can and bring this topic even further? So tune in next week, class six of the AP Bio Review, the cell and communication. Once again, I'm Andrew Dufresne. Thank you so much for your time and attention.